Hello and welcome again to another episode of Sacktown Talks. Today we have a very special guest joining us, Senator Nancy Skinner. Nancy, how's it going? Thanks for joining us. Hey, happy to be with you. Yeah, where are you joining us from today? Are you in the district or are you here in Sacramento? I am in Sacramento in my, uh, well, I'll say Capitol office, but we're in a new building because the Capitol is going to be worked on in the next couple of years. Yeah, so you're in the new swing space. How are you, I guess, enjoying the transition in the, the new building so far? It's uh, it's a transition. It's, you know, getting used to it. Yeah. Do you have uh, those curtains come with the, the office or are those temporary? <laughs> well, they have these screens. Yeah, they're they come with the office. Um, uh, they've been telling us not to put anything on the walls. But of course, you know, hey, we're going to want to decorate our walls. So we will right. be putting things on the walls. <laughs> so, Nancy, you know, before we started this, you know, I, I've talked to you many times throughout the years. But I've never looked at your bio. This is the first time I looked at your bio. And the most interesting thing I saw, of many, which there are, is in 1984, you were a student at Berkeley, and you also ran for city council. Is that right? Yes, I was a grad student. But yes, I ran for the Berkeley City Council, and I won. Wow. And so I I guess, were you one of the first students to, to, to do that? First and only. No other person while they were a registered registered student at Cal has been elected. Now, subsequent to me, we have a current council member. Um, I um, terribly blanking his name. But, you know, uh, anyway, he um, was elected right after he graduated and he had served in the student government as I had. And he had been our uh, external affairs, ASUC external affairs vice president. And that's council member Rigel Robinson. Wow. And even, even from the beginning in 1984, you were taking on big issues, styrofoam, things like that kind of, what was it like being on the city council and being a student back then? Well, it was, I mean, it was juggling a lot because I was also a new mom of all things. All right. um, but in, during that time, I was part of a really vibrant community-based electoral coalition, Berkeley Citizens Action. And that organization had, was the backbone for the successful candidacies of Tom Bates for assembly, who was later our mayor, Lonnie Hancock for mayor and then later assembly, uh, Ron Dellums for Congress. Um, you know, it was a very strong coalition, a very diverse, just a, many, many groups, uh, senior activists, Great Panthers, um, tenant activists, healthcare activists, um, student activists, um, ten, uh, rent control, people pro rent control, um, different. We, we had some of the first LGBTQ elected officials. We're talking back in the early 80s. Um, so it was this really vibrant coalition and the reason I bring it up is because it made serving on the city council easier because you really felt you were part of this big community and we worked out our positions on a lot of issues and they brought me things. It wasn't like I was just um, cer certainly I represented the citizens of Berkeley that I represented, but it was like this whole coalition brought me good ideas and uh, worked in the community to get support for those ideas. And so it was a great experience. You know, you know, college football season has just ended. And all I hear about Nancy is this name image likeness stuff all over. Athletes are transferring everywhere, getting these big deals. And, you know, you are the, the genesis of this, the start of this here in California. Kind of how, how did you uh, kind of come up with this? And um, how come your name isn't everywhere on this? You so, know? you know, who would have <laughs> expected the <clears throat> state senator, California state senator, uh, from Berkeley, white woman, uh, that I would be the one to basically change the course of student athlete history. And basically, um, you know, it's never, you never do anything alone. There were, you know, the, the NCAA was under a lot of pressure from court cases, from, you know, so many things. It was definitely, every time you turned on a college sports game, you heard some uh, pundit, or announcer, or even this athlete themselves talk about how unfair the NCA rules were about phony amateurism and such. Right. So, you know, it was really, um, I suppose you could say timing is the secret of comedy. It was like, I was a lucky timer, but um, I've actually been thinking about that issue for a very long, long time. When I was a grad student at Cal, I was one of the people that helped to organize 
the graduate um, union of teachers instructors, TAs, which is now the union that represents um, every type of graduate student employee. And I always felt that, you know, as students, we should be compensated for our work. If the university is, if we're producing something of value for the university, we should be compensated for our work. And I always looked at athletes. I'm like, you know, they're bringing a lot of value to the university. But I had the great fortune of hearing a lecture by Harry Edwards, who is a sociologist at Cal at UC Berkeley. But he was also the organizer of the uh, boycott, the Black Stu Olympic boycott in Mexico City, where the runners from San Jose State, right, yeah. uh, Juan Carlos, uh, Tommy Smith, others, you know, basically, um, you know, said, hey, uh, this amateurism is doesn't work. And he talked about just the way that especially he came from the lens of black and brown athletes generating enormous amounts of profits and money, revenue for professional sports, for colleges, and the fact that they were not adequately taken care of. They were exploited. And so I looked at it initially from a very um, racial uh, perspective. But over time, as I watched, as I watched Title IX and I saw that women athletes really get the bad end of the stick. I mean, we don't get fair amount of time in the locker rooms, fair amount of time on the equal equipment, fair amount of time on the fields and such. And then you look at what in March Madness, how they treated last year, the um, women basketball players compared uh -huh. to the male basketball right. players. I mean, it's just outrageous. And I saw that women, they don't even get a chance by and large to go pro. And when they do get pro, they're not even paid at all. So here they are at the peak of their prowess while they're a student athlete and they can't get anything. So like I said, I'd been thinking about it a long time. And when I first got elected to the state Senate in uh, 2016, I told my staff, I want student athletes to be paid. TAs are paid, you know, others are paid. They, right. they ought to be able to form a union. And my staff said I was crazy that we would never be able to pull that off. And so each year I would come back to them and say, nope, going to introduce bill, going to introduce bill. And they're like, no, no, we won't be able to do that. And I said, okay, you can't tell me no again. You have to come up with an alternative or I'm introducing the bill that I want to. And they are the ones who came up working with other people on the concept to give name, image, and likeness, which I think is a first step. It should not be the only step. Right. Well, it's amazing just kind of seeing these, these deals kind of sprout up everywhere and and, you know, with social media and everything, the, you know, the amount of money, some of these, uh, athletes and many is, women, is many women. Yeah. Great. The large followings they have. So yes, uh, it's going to be interesting to watch. Right. Definitely. Definitely changing the world of college sports and hopefully it will help the Cal bears. Right. I hope so. Cause Cal bears haven't been in the Rose bowl since 1959. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you're not one shy to take on big issues as have you taken on the NCAA and change college football. You know, the next thing, police unions, police records, kind of, you know, how have you seen your work there uh, unfold and kind of what do you have planned in the works for the future? Well, um, California, this is another one. We were a real outlier. We have a very good public records act. So, you know, if you want, if you are a resident and you want to have information about in a public employee, you can pr request that information, get records on basically every employee, right? except for law enforcement. And so for 40 years, there was no public access whatsoever to any records around any activity of a, an officer. Now, one could say, you know, why should we need that? Why, why is there need to be public records access there? You know, sunshine, transparency really helps. It helps create good government. And when it comes to law enforcement, Law enforcement, more than anything, needs the trust of the community to do their jobs. And when you feel like, hey, wait a minute, you know, we, we saw this behavior by an officer in our neighborhood. And we don't see anything that's happened to them. You know, we don't trust them. Uh, that does not bode well for solving crime. Right. And you could never find out about whether your local police department ever disciplined an officer, for example, for any of their misconduct. You couldn't even find out what misconduct might have occurred in your jurisdiction. So while I was in the assembly, I had 
uh, then Senator Leno had tried to, you know, create some open records for police. And I voted for that bill at least two times and he was never successful. And so when I got in the Senate, people approached me and I felt like, yeah, we need to keep this is uh, it's important for good policing, good public safety and good community relations. And it's just it, it's the right thing to do. So I did carry that bill, SB 1421, and I was successful and I r really was pleased. And again, it was a very huge team effort and my colleagues supported it. And then we've subsequently expanded with some other categories of records. So it's still limited access. Around other public employees, you can get much more information. So it's limited access you can get about officers' behavior, but at least it's the core things right. that, you know, core misconduct, like if an officer has um, uh, been dishonest on the job, tampered with evidence, interfered with a witness, and also around if they've, if they've engaged in excessive violence or discriminatory behavior. So now California residents can feel confident they can get that information. You know, you had a unique experience kind of starting the assembly when, you know, the budget was tough. It was difficult to negotiate. There were no uh, surpluses. And now you're kind of in this, you know, the last few years we've had surpluses and, you know, money to spend with the state. And now, you know, as you are budget chair in the Senate, uh, you know, how has it been working on the budget this last year? And, you know, with this year's surplus around 40 billion and, and maybe more kind of what's the Senate and kind of your thoughts on the budget uh, coming up here in 2022? Sure. So yes, when I got elected in the assembly 2008, double whammy. Number one, the recession. California's revenues were just evaporating. It was awful. We had like a $60 billion deficit, $60 billion. And we had to cut schools to the point where they were, you know, we already, California was already the lowest per pupil funder of its public schools and it was very, uh, we became like Mississippi. It was terrible. Right. And we had the requirement that you had to get a two thirds vote to approve the budget. We did not have a super majority of Democrats. So we had to negotiate with the Republicans and you know, hey, bipartisan effort is always good. But the problem with that particular kind of negotiation is the Republicans would hold the budget hostage right. and we wouldn't get budgets passed. It was a very traumatic experience. Now, last year, this year, as budget chair, we have revenues in excess of $60 billion, the Amazing. complete opposite, the highest revenues we've ever, ever seen, the highest per pupil funding um, uh, ever California's received and getting up into more than, you know, up to like, uh, I don't know, in the where we are in the rest of the states, but above 25 other states in right. terms of per pupil funding, which is great. And the irony of this is partly it's we have great revenues because the stock market did so well and because we have some very wealthy Californians and our progressive tax structure allows us to collect healthy amounts of revenue from those people who are doing very, very, very well. But we also have a huge inequity problem. We have a lot of Californians who are struggling and you know, what we call the middle class, it's very difficult to be middle class in California now with the cost of housing and such. And people that are in the poverty, you know, at or below poverty level is very high in California. Right. And that's just, you know, for me as a progressive Democrat that I, I can't see how we can be the fifth largest economy. And I'm now talking state of California, fifth largest economy in the world, and that we would have this level of poverty and income inequity. So um, state Senate in the Democratic wow. caucus have, um, we've really tried to, to look at how do we put California's wealth to work for an equitable economy? How do we lift up, you know, all the boats? So it's been great to be budget chair in that kind of context. And last year we were able to make California the first state to provide every public school student two free meals a day at school. So that is a great thing. So we do not have to worry about kids coming to school hungry and not being able to learn or, you know, having that difficulty. They're, they're fed if they choose to be. And that was an incredible thing to be able to pull off in last year's budget. And I'm looking forward to good things this year. You know, as, as, you, as you said, you know, there's been a lot of talk about housing in California. I know that's something you've focused on, especially in your district where, you know, housing is so tough to come by. Kind of what are you seeing in the housing space right now and kind of 
what else can you guys do to kind of make housing more affordable here in California? Well, housing is really, when I think about what are our big challenges, the pandemic, COVID's ongoing, the climate crisis, huge challenge is not going away, and housing, because we have, California has not built enough housing for decades. And when you have a shortage, like we have, a growth in population, a growth in jobs in certain of our job centers, but not a growth in housing, then that makes that com commodity very expensive. So each unit of housing that's there is very expensive. And then with just construction costs have gone up, materials costs, supply costs, labor costs. So building new housing is also expensive. And what, what that does to us is make housing really unaffordable for most Californians. Right. So we have to build a lot more and we have to provide subsidy so that a good amount of that housing can be affordable housing. And when we think about our homelessness crisis, it is very much because of a shortage of housing and that shortage leading to these high costs. Those, you know, the vast, vast majority of people who are unhoused, living on our streets, they would never have chosen to. That is not their chosen lifestyle. And many of them were living, you know, had a regular roof over their heads less than two years ago, less than three years ago, um, and are Californians. So that's something that uh, a lot of my colleagues and I have been very committed to. I'm very happy to see the governor committed to it. Last year, we put $2 billion towards, $4 billion total, $2 billion each year towards the very affordable housing, the homeless housing. We put another couple of billion towards you know, other types of affordable housing. And I look forward to continuing that type of investment again this year. Plus we passed lots of legislation that made it easier to get housing approved. Yeah, have you started seeing any benefits of your SB 330 uh, kind of being implemented yet by local governments? Yes, two of the big success stories of our housing bills, and I'm talking about the legislature as a whole, one of them was our ADU bills, the accessory dwelling units. Yeah. And the most recent bill that was successful was Assembly Member Tings. I was a co-author. Actually, it had been my bill the year before, but we, uh, anyway, it, typical what happens is sometimes a bill gets hung up in a year. So then you join forces with another colleague the following year. And that bill basically gave the green light to almost any and every single family home in California to be able to build at least one, if not more, accessory drilling units. And basically their local government's not able to tell those um, owners, not being able to tell them no. So in other words, you can't now say, no, you can't do an ADU. So what we've seen in Los Angeles, the largest number of units of new housing construction over the last three to four years have all been these accessory dwelling units. Now, many of them are up to like 800 square feet to 1,000 square feet. So they're not mm -hmm. just for a college student or a single person. There, you know, there are units that uh, can accommodate you know, a number of people. So that's been a great, great success story. And then my bill, SB 330, basically said, look, local governments, you've already done all your zoning. You've done your EIRs for that zoning. And if an application comes into your door that meets your existing rules, you have to limit the amount of time that you process that, limit the number of public hearings, and give it a green light. Because if they've met what you've asked them to meet, we need that housing built. So SB 330 um, really has, we've, uh, my staff and I, we haven't necessarily documented everyone, but we're, we're constantly being informed by a different jurisdiction or a different project, you know, a, a, a entity that is building some housing like, hey, yeah, we this housing is now going through because of SB 330. We were, you know, we've been trying to get a permit for three years, five years, whatever, but we got the green light as soon as 330 came through and we're seeing much more housing as a result. And that's a great thing. Yeah. You know, the last week, the, the big news was single payer health care that, you know, they're working on over there in the assembly. Kind of what are some of your thoughts on how California could implement a single payer health care and, and pay for it? Well, single payer is the most efficient 
form of delivery of healthcare, and it cuts out a lot of the um, <clears throat> administrative costs or middleman, as you might right. call, that is making our healthcare expensive. Um, but it's also can be costly. Eventually, it doesn't have to be so costly, but setting up the structure of it. Now, in the meantime, and there's obviously many good arguments for that for that type of system of healthcare, and most other um, economies of the size of California have that. Now, interestingly, with the governor's the budget that he proposed on January 10th, and his offer that we would provide Medi-Cal to every Californian who is eligible, regardless of their circumstance, that under that context, with the combination of the Affordable Care Act and what we have done with Medi-Cal and with, of course, Medicaid, our seniors already get, really, if we were to pass what the governor has presented to us in the budget January 10th, then we would have healthcare as an accessible for every Californian. Now, there is that question that undercovered California, some Californians whose employer doesn't provide it for them have a cost involved, but we've kept that cost much lower than most states. So there's still some affordability issues, right. but basically California would have achieved, if we approve that budget that he's proposed, we would have healthcare access to every California. And I, I guess, you know, why is that, a, I guess, not enough, I guess, for some advocates that, you know, they want a, a whole new scale system? Well, there's, you know, there's a lot of issues around, again, cost of healthcare and these different layers that add costs and whether single payer eventually could trim that down. There's also the question of, you have uh, under a Medi-Cal system, you've got some practitioners who won't take a Medi-Cal patient. So right. that can put a person at a disadvantage. Um, so those are some of the difficulties, even with the good things that we have done so far in California. Yeah. You know, global warming has, has always been a, a concern and something that, you know, you've helped uh, to work on uh, in your time here in the Senate and the Assembly. Kind of what are the some of the things you're working on now and I know you're working on some carbon sequestration. You know, why is that an answer to help kind of some of the global warming concerns we have? Well, the climate crisis is well underway, and we already have way too much carbon, way too much global warming gases in our atmosphere. And while we have to stop emissions, even stopping emissions, which is not going to happen overnight, is not gonna bring the temperatures down to the levels or avoid the catastrophic climate change that we need to avoid. We need to get some of that carbon that's up there out. And I know that some advocates feel that anything that you, if we move towards any types of carbon sequestration, that that's just like a path for justifying fossil fuels. But you know, it doesn't have to be a path for justifying fossil fuels. It really can be a path for getting carbon out and buying us some time as we transition off the fossil fuels. So the the um, one of the bills I'll be working on this year, my colleague Senator Becker put new requirements on our cement industry, and so cement is a very uh, very polluting from a climate point of view. Um, I don't want cement necessarily cement manufacturing to leave California, so because we we produce cleaner cement than almost anywhere else. So if we can assist them and pilot some carbon capture at our cement facilities, then we can see how carbon sequestration works, whether we can capture some there, and we can uh, assist that the cement manufacturing. So that's one of the things I'm looking at. Oh, interesting. You know, you're never one to shy away from anything. You know, we've covered a lot of things here today, but, you know, what else are you looking for? you know, towards, you know, doing this year with your legislation package? Um, good questions. I'm uh, green hydrogen. So one of the fuels that could really help us in the climate crisis is non-fossil based hydrogen. Um, and we can use, we can use our solar resources when we're producing more solar than we need, we could use it to produce hydrogen. And then hydrogen could be used to fuel power plants, fuel vehicles, lots of things. But we need to create the right market signals to drive that non-fossil based 
hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things I'm looking at. But the other thing I'm really excited about are, you know, I mentioned early in our conversation about the inequity in California. So we have a lot of kids who, uh, children who are in poverty level um, and that's being exacerbated now by the pandemic. We had many, many California children, 20,000 estimate who lost their parent or caregiver to COVID. So now they've had a death and if they were low income already, if their family was low income, and then they have a parent that might've been the, uh, an income earner who's passed away, the federal government provides some survivor benefits. But when those kids turn 18, who, you know, where's, where's their support? So I have uh, introduced a bill that would create hope accounts for the low, for the children who lost a parent to COVID, who is in from a low income family. So that when they turn 18, they have some money that they can look to, to help them, whether it's pursue their education, pursue training, put the first and last month deposit, just give them that hope that the rest of us usually rely on our families for. And then we also want to use those hope accounts for our um, children that are in long-term foster care. Because if you're in long-term foster care, that means you don't have parents you can rely on so that's the other concept within our hope account. So I'm very excited about that. Well, I know, I know you need to go. You're, you're a busy woman and doing big things. So thank you so much for taking the time and joining us. And we look forward to seeing what you're up to this year. And hopefully we can catch up on, uh, with you later. Well, it was great fun. And thank you for inviting me. All right. Thank you, Senator Skinner.